All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Tonight we are going to be in the book of uh, Hebrews. We are making our way through uh, 26 lessons. Good to see everybody here tonight. We have visitors here among us. Thank you for being here. So we have been studying this book now uh, a little over a month, and there are 26 lessons. And so we're going to be, uh, in particular, in Hebrews chapter 7. Lord willing, we will wrap up Hebrews chapter 7 uh, this coming Sunday. So let's begin with prayer. we got a lot of ground we need to cover tonight. And, uh, and then we'll dive into our lesson. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the beautiful day you've given us, the weather you provide for us, the blessings you give to us, uh, both physically and spiritually. Thank you, Father, for the fellowship that we have uh, through you and your son, Jesus Christ, and the, the fellowship that we have here as your people. Bless us, Heavenly Father, and help us to truly recognize the, the spiritual blessings that we have. Help us, Father, never to become sluggish. Help us, Father, never to uh, lose sight of the great salvation that we have through your Son. Help us, Father, to truly appreciate who Jesus is, that he is our great high priest, our great apostle, that he is reigning in heaven at your side. Help us, Father, to continue to run the race. Help us, Father, to finish our race so that we may be with you and your Son one day. We are thankful for the confidence that we can have Help us, Father, to remember your precious promises. Be with those who are hurting at this time, those who may be hurting in our family, those who are hurting around the world. Be with those in El Paso and Dayton and those who are suffering. Uh, help us, Father, to continue to shine our lights each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we are making our way through, uh, through the book of Hebrews here. If you have your Bible, let's begin actually in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Melchizedek, and uh, Hebrews chapter 7 is really all about um, this great man that we read about. And if you remember, we have um, had a couple, I guess, hints or views uh, about this man, who he is. And the Hebrew writer now in chapter 7 is really going to dive into uh, more about Melchizedek, who he is, and what that means uh, about who Christ is, and that Christ is after the order of of Melchizedek. And so um, we re first read about Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, we're going to see uh, just some details uh, of, of this prophet, of this man, or this king and priest, rather. In Genesis chapter 14, we are introduced to him. We see Abraham, and we see that there are uh, a number of battles that are taking place with some of the kings of the nations. If you look at verse number 11 and verse number 12, we see that uh, Lot, Abraham's uh, nephew, uh, finds himself in the middle of all of this. The Bible says, Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. As you continue reading down this chapter here, what Abraham's going to do, he's going to get some of his men and he's going to go and rescue his nephew, Lot. So we read about that in verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Then what we find is the introduction to Melchizedek in verse number 18. The Bible says that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. And so we first are introduced to this man here, and we learn some things about him, that he is a king and that he is also a priest, and that he's going to bless Abraham, and that Abraham is going to give him a tenth of all of his spoils. And so just by looking at this one passage here, we immediately begin to see uh, the greatness of this man, Melchizedek. Um, by his titles, he was both a king and priest. The exchange that he had with uh, Abraham, the blessing that uh, he's given to Abraham, uh, and his priesthood, and we'll learn more about that as well. Then when you move over to Psalm 110, and Psalm 110 should be familiar if you've been a part of the class, because in Hebrews chapter 1, the Hebrew writer quotes from Psalm 110, if you have been doing the daily Bible reading in the book of Acts, you will recall that Psalm 110 is also referenced in Acts chapter 2 and verse number uh, 34. So in Psalm 110, we read about, uh, we know this psalm was written by King David. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, Jesus used this psalm uh, throughout the Gospels. One example, if you just want to write this down, is Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 43. Uh, and so we know that King David penned this psalm. It's a messianic psalm, and we see this great king. And you look at Psalm 10 and verse 1, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. Now look at verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Am I too loud? Is this, is this good? Okay. So what we learn here is that, is that the Messiah would not only be king, but he would also be a priest, both king and priest. And so while Psalm 110 or verse 1 is often quoted, we also are going to see in the book of Hebrews, Psalm 110 or verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so that's the information that we have about this man that we're going to be talking about. And so what the Hebrew writer is going to help us to see, if you want to turn over to Hebrews chapter 2 now, please, what the Hebrew writer is going to help us to see is the similarity between the respective priesthoods of Christ and Melchizedek. And he's going to be arguing some, some very powerful points. If you remember, the Hebrew writer is encouraging these saints to remain with God, to remain with him, to remain faithful. And we have already seen some details about Christ being our uh, great high priest. Let me just give you a couple of verses here uh, to keep in mind. And we've already looked at this. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Hebrews 2 and verse 17. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. If you recall in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, the language there, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now look over in chapter 4, and we're just moving through these quickly because we've already read all of this. And verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we're going to learn more, obviously, about him in Hebrews chapter 5. And then, if you recall, and we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 5 here in just a moment. If you recall our study from last Wednesday, the Hebrew writer is going to end chapter 6 in verse number 20 by saying where Jesus has entered a for, as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, it, you know, we've already seen Jesus being described as a great high priest and who he is, and now we're really going to dive into uh, a lot more information about uh, Jesus being our high priest. Now, if you remember, and this is going to be important as we look at uh, chapter 7, in chapter 5, remember in verse 1 of chapter 5, the Hebrew writer begins to talk more about high priests. He said, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. So he gives us some details about the high priest, right? Number one, in the Old Testament, uh, the priests, they were taken from men, and that's going to allow them or would allow them to certainly be uh, sympathetic to uh, those individuals uh, that they were making sacrifices on behalf to God. Uh, number two, we see here that these men were appointed by God. So not just anybody could become a high priest, right? We've already talked about that. Uh, and so that becomes important as well. And, and we see what they did. They offered sacrifices, both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And so what the Hebrew writer is going to do, he's going to say, look, um, Christ is now our high priest. And he, too, has lived among men. Uh, and he suffered in the flesh. And he can relate to us and the things that we have gone through. And he has been appointed by God. That's the point he's making in verse 5. 
So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Anybody remember where he's quoting from? The book of Psalms, what chapter? Chapter 2 and verse 7. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, which is from Psalm 110. We just read that. So Psalm 110 and verse number 4. So he wants to talk more about uh, Christ and Melchizedek. And by the way, let's make sure we understand that the distinction between Christ and those Levitical priests, Christ was sinless. And so he didn't have to offer any sacrifices for himself. Now, he wants to talk a lot more about Melchizedek and Christ, but there's a problem. What's the problem? Real quickly, what's the problem? Anyone? All right, what's the problem? Look at verse number uh, Look at verse number 10, actually. He talks about Melchizedek again. He says, being designated by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. See the problem? That was the problem. That word dull, too, is the same word that is used in chapter 6 where he says so that you will not be sluggish so I wanted to, to add that to um, to our thoughts I did not mention that I'm just doing some more studying on that and so that gives us some more I think um, insight of where these individuals were so before he can really dive into Melchizedek he has to kind of he has to rebuke them to a degree right he has to admonish them he has to help them to see look there's a great danger uh, w- what were they eating milk or meat or where were they they're, they're still consuming milk, right? And so he's trying to get them to see, listen, those elementary principles, those foundations, those things that you've learned, those things are very important. You don't disregard those things, but there needs to be a, ma- a maturing process that's taken place. Then in chapter 6, what does he warn them about? The first half of chapter 6. You guys remember that from Wednesday? What did he warn the saints about? Exactly, about falling away. And Look at the language again in verse 7. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those for whose uh, sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. You know, they should, have been, they, should have been, they should have been producing fruit. Think of all the blessings that they were partakers of God and partakers of this heavenly calling, and yet they weren't. And so the warning is, he says, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So the warning is very clear. That they needed to, uh, they needed to mature. That they needed to grow. It needed to be evident in their lives. Now he's going to encourage them, and then if you remember, he's going to push them in verse twelve. He, he make sure you're not sluggish, but be imitators of those who, through faith and patient, inherit the promise. And so, as he's encouraging them, he's reminding them about Abraham. And what a bet, what a great example to talk about Abraham. Abraham in Genesis twelve and throughout twenty two, where. God gave Abraham these great promises. There were more than three, but we often think about the land, the nation, and Isaac. Uh, But God gave Abraham these great promises. He had some struggles from time to time, but he would obtain the promises. For when God, verse 13, made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And so what the Hebrew writer is going to do here, look at verse 16. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. So he's really encouraging the Christians. Look. God cannot lie. Just as he fulfilled those promises that, that he made to Abraham, he made a promise and he swore with an oath that the things that he said would happen would and what happened. They all came to pass exactly as he said. And so this is a, a, a text that has great encouragement. And remember what he said in chapter 2. Remember what the Hebrew writer said in chapter 2 uh, and verse 16. For surely he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. So we should be looking at Abraham and these promises, this oath that God made, and the fact that he fulfilled his words. That should be a source of encouragement and motivation for us. And so he reminds us that we need to take hold of this hope, this hope we have an anchor for the soul or of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner. For us, having become a high priest 
forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So while he had to take a little bit of a break, he said, okay, now I'm going to come back and I've got to talk about this. This is really important. And so now we're going to talk about this as well. So just understand the background, the context, what's going on here. So look at verse number 1 of chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham, and blessed the one who had the promises. But without dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Look at verse 8. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in, the case, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. He was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? and not be designated according to the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. This is clear still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek. Who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is attested of him. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So that's really where our questions are going to come from. If you have your workbook, we're on lesson number six, which is, or I'm sorry, yeah, lesson number, actually no, I'm one lesson ahead, lesson number five, which is on page number 11. Now, some of us may be thinking, too, all right, I've had a really long day. I've been frustrated today. You don't understand what's going on in my life right now. Why do we have to talk about this man that is barely recorded in the Scripture? And how is this going to help me with my issues in life? Well, number one, we need to grow, right? So this is given to us by the Holy Spirit. It's important information. This was given to the saints to help them to remember their great high priest and how superior he is over those priests of old and over, over the Levitical priesthood and what he is now ushered in. And so there is great application for us. Um, sometimes this will take some time for us to really think about and consider, but it's good for us to talk about uh, these types of, of, of questions and lessons. And so when you go back to um, Hebrews chapter 6, the Hebrew writer said in verse 20 that he has uh, he's become a high priest forever according to the order of, of Melchizedek. And so that word order there um, is the idea of uh, in the same category or class as Melchizedek with respect to priesthood. Uh, There's a certain pattern or order or arrangement or identifying features in Melchizedek in which we can learn something about Jesus. Uh, And so understanding that is going to help us as he begins to talk about uh, Melchizedek. And I believe it's that word where we get our word taxonomy if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, which deals with classifications as well. So as you think about Hebrews chapter 7, think about what the, what the Hebrew writer is trying to do. He's been talking about the superiority of Christ. And even when you get to chapter 8, look at chapter 8 and verse number 1, then we're going to dive into this. He says, now the main point and what has been said is this. So if you want to skip ahead, he's, he's going to sum it all up. Here's the main point. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, and minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. And so he, he's going through all of this for a reason, and certainly he's going to, again, demonstrate who Christ is and his superiority. And so question number one looks at, or question number one 
Uh, let's talk about that here. Um, and let me just say this too. I, I got a lot of notes that I want to share with you. You know, there's not a lot about this man, Melchizedek. And as a result of that, there's a lot of different views that are out there, a lot of different things that have been said throughout the centuries. Um, and one of the things, or one of the biggest views that some may have is that this man was, you know, supernatural in nature or something like that. The language sometimes, particularly in those first three verses, sometimes can be a little bit challenging. But uh, as you walk through it, we're going to see that that's not the case. Um, and so our responsibility is ultimately just to stick with the scriptures. So we already know, question number one, uh, who uh, the Hebrew writer is talking about. We already read Genesis 14 which again is kind of summarizing, or the Hebrew writer is summarizing uh, what took place there in Genesis 14. So we know king, uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem. Uh, we know that he was priest of the Most High God. King of Salem, that seems to be uh, eventually the place which would be uh, Jerusalem. Uh, we know that uh, it says in verse 2, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils was first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So he breaks down and he gives us some more information uh, about uh, just describing who he is and his name. Um, one of the things that's interesting about that as well, this idea of being uh, king of righteousness and king of peace, uh, doesn't that sound like the Messiah? Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, remember in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Hebrew writer said, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. And um, certainly king or, or Christ is um, a king of righteousness and uh, prince of peace. Uh, and so even there, you see the similarities uh, between the two. The second part of the question, uh, what does Hebrews 7, 3 say that we don't know about him? And how does this make him comparable to the Son of God? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, and let's look at these phrases um, and what the Hebrew writer is trying to emphasize. In verse number 3, he said, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Are there any comments or questions before we dive into that? Any comments or questions before we look at that? Okay, so... A couple of thoughts just to keep in mind, I'll, and I'll open it up here in just a moment. When you think about the Levitical priesthood, remember that they were appointed by God, and there was a succession of, of priests. After one of the high priests died, another would take his place. Uh, the priest would have to come from the tribe of Levi. And that helps us to see that genealogy would become really important for the Levitical priest. And let me just show you real quickly here how important it would be. Go back to the book of Ezra, please. After the people um, returned from exile, uh, look at Ezra chapter 2. In Ezra chapter 2, and this may not always be uh, maybe, I don't know, the word appealing to us, but it's very important for us. The Bible obviously has a lot about uh, genealogy, and we see this also in Ezra chapter 2. Uh, we see in verse number 1 of Ezra chapter 2, now these are the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon. And so he's going to give a, a long list of individuals, and he's going to number the people. When you get to verse number 61, it says, Of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, uh, the sons of Hakos, uh, and he gives some, some additional names. Now look at verse 62. These searched among their ancestral registration, but they could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. So genealogy became really important. If it could not be proven that they were from the proper lineage or pedigree, then these men could not become priests. They could not become high priests. And so I think this is interesting, and, and not just interesting, but important for us as we think about what the Hebrew writer is getting ready to say with respect to Melchizedek and the contrast that he's going to be making about his priesthood, the priesthood of Christ and that of the priesthood of the Levites. So when he says without father and without mother, and I'll just start off and we can open it up here, uh, he's not saying that he is eternal. Uh, he's not teaching that at all. Uh, when he says without father, without mother, it's the idea that we don't know his father or his mother. Uh, it simply means unknown who his father and mother were. It does not mean that he did not have a father or a mother. 
Uh, he was a priest, even though he didn't have a recorded ancestry. Doing some more reading on this, the rabbis uh, commonly said that a newly proselyted Gentile would have, he has no father since he has no legitimate Jewish ancestry. And so he didn't have that, that priestly lineage. I think that's the point that he's trying to make. And when you understand how important that would be with respect to the Levitical priesthood, you begin to see this distinction between his priesthood and that of the Levitical priesthood. Uh, any comments or questions with, about that? Uh, that's important to understand because he's going to be making these contrasts all throughout uh, this chapter, or at least the initial part of the chapter. And again, remember, he's ultimately pointing people to Christ. He's ultimately pointing people to sh show them, these saints, the superiority of Christ. Does that make sense? Any comments, questions about that? Yes, sir. But he had to be Gentile, right? Because he Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, you know, he pops onto the scene. And it is interesting, too, even in the days of Moses, uh, Jethro, his father in law, I believe he's described as being a priest as well. And I think he would have fallen under that category as a Gentile. And we also know that he was worshiping the same God as Abraham, Melchizedek as he described him as the God Most High. And so it's the same God uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, that Abraham was worshiping, obviously. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, any other thoughts, questions about that? So think about what he's doing here. He says, without father, without mother. Uh, so understanding that's going to go a long way. Then he says, without genealogy. So what does he mean when he says without genealogy? Again, I think the point that he's just trying to emphasize is and again, this is going to be a comparison with respect to the Levitical priesthood, how important genealogy really was to them. Well, Melchizedek does not have genealogy. Um, and so when he says without genealogy, he doesn't have a, we don't have his recorded genealogy. And so this becomes important because he didn't obtain his priesthood by succession. Uh, you think about the, the priest in the Old Testament it was going to come through that, the tribe of Levi, and uh, they would have to have that, that pedigree. And so a distinction uh, is being made about this. Furthermore, when you look at verse number 6, look at verse number 6. The Hebrew writer is not saying that he doesn't have any family or genealogy with respect to Melchizedek. He says, but the one whose genealogy is not traced from them. You see that? He says, the one whose genealogy is not traced from them. So he's not saying that he just didn't have any genealogy at all. He's just saying that this, his genealogy is not traced from them with respect to uh, the Jews. And so he, he's going somewhere with this language without genealogy, without father and mother. He didn't obtain this priesthood that he had uh, by succession. And there is certainly a distinction to be made between him and the Levitical priest. Comments or questions about that? Does that make sense? So he says, without priest, I'm sorry, without father, without mother, excuse me, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. So if we can understand the idea without father, without mother, and also without genealogy, then I think this is going to help us to understand what he's trying to get across without beginning of days nor end of life. Again, I don't, th I don't believe he's teaching that uh, Melchizedek is eternal. Uh, I don't believe he's teaching that here. Um, certainly, um, there's another uh, important piece that would be important for the genealog uh, genealogy records of the Jews, and that would be a person's birth and a person's death, uh, because after one uh, a priest died, then another one would have to come uh, and take his position. Uh, and so understanding that, uh, after the death of the high priest, another one would assume him or be his successor. But I think what the Hebrew writers is trying to emphasize here is that uh, with a priesthood like that of Melchizedek, uh, this was not received by right of some type of hereditary succession. Uh, and so this information about uh, the beginning of days or when he died would, would be unnecessary. Uh, and so he's making another distinction here that his priesthood um, did not require having all of this information. Um, and so that's the point I think he's trying to get across. Uh, that his priesthood was not going to be one that was going to be passed on to successors and having all of this information and uh, understanding the importance of this information. And so when he uses this language here, I think it all connects together 
um, when it says, without father, without mother, without genealogy, neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now, um, the reason why I'm just emphasizing this idea, I don't think he's eternal, because I think the language in here with the point that he's making, he's making this contrast between the, the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of the Levitical priest and how Christ is superior over that Levitical priesthood. Uh, comments or questions about that? So understanding this, again, I think is really important. Then there's another phrase that sometimes people have questions. He says, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So some translations, I'm reading from the New American Standard, some translations say forever. Um, <clears throat> I think it's clear for us to understand that he's not still alive because if he was, then that would mean that he was still functioning as a priest and that would pose a lot of problems, right? There would be a lot of issues with that. So this language forever sometimes can have a broad usage in the scriptures. Uh, when Moses back in Exodus 21 uh, was, was talking about slaves or the laws that God had given, uh, we see how slaves could become a slave forever. Uh, and that's simply the idea of during their, during their lifetime. Uh, and so sometimes this word forever can have a broad usage, and it may not always denote the idea of an unending, unending chronological duration. What else is interesting, you look at the Levitical priests, go look back real quickly here in Exodus 29. In Exodus chapter 29, this same language was used with respect to the Levitical priest, uh, this idea of forever. And so understanding contextually how this word is used and what he's trying to drive at here is going to become important. In Exodus chapter 29 and verse number 9, he says, You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them. And they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. Uh, so he uses that language there. And we understand, um, you know, we understand what that means. Uh, that it's not literally forever because obviously things have changed. In Exodus chapter 40 and verse number 15, look over real quickly here please. In Exodus chapter 40 and verse number 15. Exodus chapter 40 and verse number 15. And you shall anoint them, even as you have anointed their father, that they may minister as priests to me, and their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generation. So you see how this language is often used, and so sometimes there can be... Um, a broad sense which is being stated here. So this language here that he remains a priest um, perpetually, uh, there again I think is a distinction being made between the, um, the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of the Levites and naturally the priesthood uh, of Christ. Uh, we know that the Levitical priesthood, uh, the difference between the Levitical priesthood and the other two priesthood was that uh, with respect to the Levitical priesthood, it was the priestly succession that was promised to be forever. Uh, one man was not going to remain as that high priest forever. Eventually he would die, and then someone else would come and, and take his place. Uh, but the Messiah and Melchizedek uh, are described as having been designated priests forever. And so one has said this at the point the Hebrew writer is making when he says that Melchizedek abides as a priest forever is that he's personally fulfilled the full duration of that priestly service. He himself was a priest forever, not he and a priestly succession. It was him. It was him, and, and that was his role and only his role and for no one else. And so this seems to foreshadow the priesthood of the Messiah. And naturally, the Messiah, this is what Hebrews 7 is going to be teaching us, uh, he personally functions as a high priest forever. Uh, for the full duration of his required service, and we read more about that when we get to verse number 16 and verse number 25. So I think, again, he's, he's, he's making this contrast that, that Melchizedek is not literally alive. Uh, he's certainly not um, performing uh, the role as a priest today. Uh, at some point in time, uh, he would die, just like, like other men. Uh, and yet Christ, he is to endure throughout the generations. He is to live forever and he's going to be able to fully meet the intercessory needs uh, of humanity for all time and that's what the Hebrew writer is going to emphasize later on when we get to verse number um, 
verse number 25, he says, Therefore he is able to also, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So those phrases here, um, I think, are all connected. And understanding this priesthood of Melchizedek and, and what it teaches us about the priesthood of Christ, uh, him being that sole possessor of that priesthood, um, that this was not going to be something that would um, uh, continue on with someone else. I think that's the idea that he's trying to get across. Yes, sir. I can't think Sure, and Melchizedek, if I'm understanding what you're saying, you know, he helps us to see, he helps us to learn more about Christ and, and him serving as a high priest now. And that's the point that the Hebrew writer is trying to make. That's why he's using Psalm 110 so much. He's using Psalm 110 in verse 4. Basically, he's just really breaking down Psalm 110 in verse number 4 as he talks about Jesus after the order of, uh, or the arrangement, remember that, the order of Melchizedek. So he's driving home this point, and he's making it very clear, and if you really, and that, that's what he's going to do later on in the next few verses. What's he going to do? He's going to make it very clear that is Jesus inferior or superior to those Levitical priests? He's far superior. And he's actually going to make that point through Melchizedek, right, with how Abraham is going to offer uh, a tenth of all of his possessions to him. And so this is the argumentation that he's making, uh, which is really powerful, and it really goes back to the importance of Psalm 110, and it goes back to the importance of just how in-depth the Hebrew writer is really trying to go to drive home this point, to not become sluggish, and not to go backwards, and to remain with your Savior, remain with your Messiah. Uh, and so he's really trying to emphasize this, uh, and it, it makes for a great study. Hopefully that's all clear. Are there questions? Comments, uh, disagreements. All right. So um, let's move on then. There's a lot of information there. So let's look at question number two. Question number two in Hebrews uh, 7 and verse 4 it says, Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. So what does he want his listeners to do? Hey, check out this guy. All right. I mean, this guy, he's, he's, he's pretty. You know, he, he's someone you really need to think about. That's the that's point that he's trying to make, okay? Uh, uh, and he, the question is, what does the Hebrew writer say he's going to prove uh, in the succeeding verses? Uh, so, uh, he's, number one, he wants, he wants them to see, I want you to observe how great this man was. And what is the, what's the point that he's going to attempt to prove? What's he trying to demonstrate to his listeners here? Uh, and verse, uh, as you get into verse number five and the following, uh, you guys help me out. We only got a few more minutes. What is he going to try to to demonstrate or will demonstrate as he talks about this great man? Jewish nation, Father Abraham, who is the greatest, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, the lesser was was received the blessing, blessing from the greater. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Think how important Abraham was and is. We still talk about him today. Remember that promise God gave him? Your name will be blessed. We still talk about Abraham today. And, you know, yeah, how much bigger does one get than Abraham by which God gave promises to? Uh, And this is who we read about all throughout the scriptures. And yet, what do we find? Um, We find that Melchizedek, this king and priest, is going, to, uh, is going to bless Abraham. And Abraham responds by giving him a tenth of all of the things that he had. Uh, and so the fact that he's going to bless Abraham, the one who had the promises, clearly is showing that he is superior th- than Abraham. And now when you understand that Jesus came after the order of the Levitical priest, everybody please say no. Uh oh, we're all falling asleep. That was a trick question. He came after the order of Melchizedek. So, understanding this, is, he's driving home the point of just how far greater, how far superior Christ really is. You guys see that? Does that make sense here? 
And so when he says in verse 4, now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. And so again, as, you, as we continue on, uh, the point that he's going to be making here in verse 5 and 6, he says, but the one whose genealogy is not traced from them, referring to the, to the tribe of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. So he's just driving home this point that, that Tim had just mentioned earlier, uh, that the priests of Levi were to receive a tenth, the Levitical priests and all the Jews came out of the loins of Abraham, but Melchizedek superseded them as he was a contemporary with Abraham, and he both received tithes from Abraham, and he also blessed him. So it's very clear according to verse number 7, but without dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Uh, so understanding this, again, he's just driving home this point of what we already read back in Genesis chapter 14. Of, of, of who Melchizedek is, and if this is true about him, then also what is this going to teach us about Christ? If Christ is from the order or after the order of Melchizedek, then how far superior is he over the Levitical priesthood? And if that is the case, uh, then they truly need to recognize um, who Christ is and exactly what Christ has done for them. Uh, comments or questions about that? Okay, so let's look at verse number uh, 8, 9, and 10. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in the case one receives them, but in that case, one receives them of whom it is witness uh, that he lives on. Um, And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And so... What's the argument that he's making in verses uh, 8, 9, and 10? Uh, And what's he trying to demonstrate ultimately? In a nutshell, what's he saying in verses 8, 9, and 10? And what is he trying to to ultimately demonstrate? So the uh, the Jew really came through Levi, who came through Abraham. (coughs) So they're, they're inferior. Yeah, they're inferior to him. And and then he's saying, you know, by the way, if you really think about it, you can look at it in this way, so to speak, right? In a figurative sense, you know, they were also offering up or giving a tenth to him as well. That's exactly right. So, again, the point that he's trying to make here is, again, how superior Melchizedek really is. And if Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, then that also says something very important about him. And so it's a powerful argumentation and for us, it may seem, you know, all of this back and forth, uh, we may not spend as much time in Leviticus and Numbers and really thinking about an Exodus, you know, all the details about the priest. But the point that he's making and trying to drive home here is really powerful. And so don't lose sight of really uh, the, the so what behind all of this because it really has implications for us. To the point that he says in verse 11, now perfection was through the Levitical priesthood. For on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? And so this takes us to question number five. Question number five, he's asking uh, a rhetorical question. And what is the main point that he's trying to get them to see? Essentially, he's trying to, he's trying to say if, if everything was essentially okay, with respect to the law, then there would not need to be a change. And yet, that is exactly what we see here. So if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, um, and you can almost think about the Levitical priesthood of of a nice way of summing up the law, just how connected they are and all the things that they did and how important that priesthood is and tied up to the law. If you get rid of that priesthood here or now, then then you also are going to have to remove the entire law. And there's going to be something new that's going to be ushered in. Uh, and so he's, he's emphasizing here something, per, or something powerful. When he says, now, perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, um, if it could fully, or, you know, if it was fully adequate or sufficient to fully uh, remove sins of people, uh, then there wouldn't be a basis 
um, for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek. But he's now helping us to see that indeed there is or was a need for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek. So what we're going to see in the last half of this chapter here, verses 12 through 28, and we'll finish this up, Lord willing, on Sunday, he's just continuing to drive home this point. Now remember, those passages that we read earlier from chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 about Christ being our great high priest and how we can approach the throne of grace with confidence and what he is doing for us uh, at this very moment in heaven. All of that becomes important. And so we'll stop here and we'll pick up Sunday, Lord willing, and we'll wrap up uh, Hebrews chapter 7. So be sure to look at the next lesson on page number 12.